Now today I want to talk in broad outlines once again about a quite different approach to theodicy, an approach which is usually called Iranian, I-R-E-N-A-E-A-N, -E -E Iranian. So human perfection, rather than being something original from which humans fell, is something that awaits them in the future. That's the important bit. Human perfection, rather than being something that humans enjoyed at the beginning, as in the Augustinian approach, from which they fell, is something that awaits them in the future. Now, from this starting point, it's possible to develop a quite different theodicy from that developed by St. Augustine. Instead of a fall from perfection, humans are pictured as being in a situation in which they have to rise towards perfection. And their sense of fallenness is a sense of not having yet arrived, of falling short of the goal. Why was it that God created human beings less than perfect? Why not create them perfect from the outset without any inclination to evil and avoid all the nastiness of a fallen creation? Well, Irenaeus explains the divine intention by arguing that God must, in a sense, distance himself from men and women and in a sense remain hidden from them in order to give them the freedom necessary, necessary to be able to make decisions for themselves. So an epistemic distance is a distance so far as the knowledge of God or the perception of God's presence is concerned. And from Irenaeus's point of view, this means that originally creation did not and never ever has enjoyed the unimpeded vision of God. Instead of the unimpeded vision of God from which Adam and Eve are said to have fallen, they can be thought of as enjoying a lesser knowledge or perception of God, but with a potential to rise to a greater knowledge or to greater things. And this means that from the outset, God's presence and activity in creation is in a sense hidden or ambiguous, capable of being detected and perceived, or capable of being ignored. All right. When you get the first page, just read that sentence and count up the number of F's in it. The number of F's, and keep the number to yourself. Okay. Anybody got a page with two F's in the sentence? I've done counting yet. Jim's got a two. Anybody got three? Quite a number. Anybody got four? Anybody got five? Anybody got six? Okay, we're all different. It's the same sentence that everybody's looking at. And some are saying there are two Fs, some are saying three, some are saying four, some are seven, five, and some are saying six. Uh, <laughs> now my point is, there are, there are, there are seven or six or seven. Uh, you're just not seeing it. Now this is what I'm calling an epistemic distance. You are not seeing what's there in front of your very eyes. They won't be convinced. There are seven. Okay. Okay. You've got the point. The point is that that we we have something built into us called a scotoma. We don't see everything there is in front of us, even right in front of our eyes, to see. We see what we think we see, and uh, reality might be quite quite different. So the very ambiguity of God's presence and activity in the world allows some to see and some not to see. The ambiguity is exactly like the, the chalice or the two faces in, the, in the, um, the page you've got. And this freedom to see or not to see is essential if humans are to be really free to make moral and spiritual, spiritual decisions one way or the other. And they must be free in this way, if they are to become autonomous human persons rather than mere puppets. If God throws his weight around, reveals himself in an absolutely unambiguous way, then the only response to him is a kind of mechanical, compulsory assent. You have no, no freedom not to be aware of God's presence and activity. So he must act 
in a hidden way in order to give us the freedom either to respond or not to respond. And we have to have that freedom to respond or not to respond if our response is going to be a response of love. Because love is free giving of oneself and not a cold, mechanical, forced response. Now in this way, God's presence has to be less than unequivocally and undeniably or automatically evident to us. And that means that it must be possible for human perception to come to, rests, to rest in the created world itself without passing beyond the created world to its hidden creator, or partially hidden creator. We're placed in a world in which there are sufficient hints and glimpses of God's presence to allow us humans, if we're inclined or minded to do so, freely to enter into a personal relationship with God. So this then, in broad outline, is the Irenaean approach to theology. Humans live at a distance from God's goal for them, not because they have fallen from that goal, but because they, in a sense, have yet to arrive at it. So God, and, as it were, allows or permits, by giving us absolute freedom, or the, the maximal amount of freedom, he allows or permits the possibility of moral evil simply by creating humans at a distance from himself. He doesn't create evil, but he creates humans with the possibility of doing evil. Because this <laughs> epistemic distance explains how it can be that humans do not act according to God's will. So he doesn't create evil, but he allows for the possibility of it. And humans are free to ignore him and to go their own way. And it was necessary for them to be set at a distance from God so that they might have the freedom to develop as authentic, autonomous, responsible persons rather than as puppets or automatons. And human beings, by being placed in the created order, the natural order, with God himself set at a distance, an epistemic distance from them, are free to immerse themselves in the natural order if they're minded to do so. Just as you're free to interpret the chalice as a chalice and not see the two faces at all. You, can, you are free to immerse yourself in the created order with God himself set at an epistemic distance. And we're free, therefore, to ignore God and therefore to regard nature as an independent order. And insofar as humans are free to treat nature as a purely natural phenomenon, they forfeit the possibility of attaining the vision of God. So they're free to live their lives in relation to the world rather than in relation to God. God gives them that freedom by setting them, them at an epistemic distance from himself. And indeed, the human location at an epistemic distance from God makes it virtually inevitable that this should be so, because it's much easier to organize one's life in relation to what is obvious, material things of this world, to what is easily and clearly, if superficially seen, than in relation to God, who is not so clearly seen. Um, um, when Jesus, when Jesus um, teaches that he is a Messiah who must suffer, which is contrary to expectation, they can't understand. Peter says, oh, no, no, you can't suffer because you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You think as men think, not as God thinks. He's a Messiah of a different kind. And then the disciples misunderstand, not only Peter, but the disciples on the road in the next chapter of Mark, for example, in chapter 9, they're walking along the road and um, Jesus says, what are, you, what are you arguing about on the way? And he says, we're arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And he says, you don't understand. This is not, it's not like that. The kingdom isn't a, a kingdom of that kind of power. And then the next chapter, James and John say, give us places on the right and the left when you come in your kingdom. And he says, that's not me, possible for me to give. I'm not that kind of Messiah. So they misunderstand, they misperceive the true nature of his messiahship. And then he comes upon blind Bartimaeus, and that story is the only miracle story in the second half of, of um, Mark's gospel. And as it turns out, it's not really a miracle story at all. It's really a parable of the true disciple, because Bartimaeus sees clearly who Jesus is and follows in the way. That's the, f the important phrase at the end of the story. He follows as the true disciple. He takes up his cross and follows in the way of messiahship that Jesus came to reveal and to act out, as it were. 
And, and then comes, after the Bartimaeus story, comes the passion narrative. And then it's at the foot of the cross, when the soldier sees what kind of Messiah this really is, that he's able to say, or he has, Mark has somebody able to say, right at the end of the Gospel, truly this was the Son of God. You can only say that once you've seen what kind of Messiah he is, a suffering, suffering servant kind of Messiah. So this is all to do with the epistemic distance. God doesn't reveal himself in such a way that we are compelled to respond. He reveals sufficient of himself to allow a response and insufficient of himself to compel a response. That's what human freedom is already about, all about. Well, I think that might just about get us to the end of, of what, what time we've got to do on, on theodicy. And that means we don't have anything else to do except for me. I have to, I have to mark the papers. Yeah. So that's that. Good. 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 Sarah.